All right, everybody, we are going to be talking about naturopathic medicine today. And I'm going to say up top here, if you're watching this video on YouTube, you're watching it after the fact, not live, because I'm going to start severely decreasing the amount of live content I do on COVID specifically because of the censorship rules. So if you want to start seeing this stuff live, you got to pay attention to my other platforms. Right now we're live on Rockfin. It's going to be up in full on my other platforms, Locals and Odyssey. But uh, YouTube's only going to get this beginning portion of it. And again, as many of you know, I've already been suspended twice. So trying to sort of fly under the radar, still get the information out there to the people who want to know more. And then you can take the bridge to the other world where we can talk about uh, everything without worrying about getting booted off. So um, quick disclaimer that I just want to say also before we talk about this topic in particular, and I'm going to start saying this. On every COVID video, really, where we're talking about medicine, and that is that, hey, I'm learning just like everybody else. So I want you all to question everything and be skeptical and uh, do your own research because it's really important in today's world to make sure we know what we're talking about and that we take responsibility for our own actions and uh, and our own knowledge. And so uh, I came out of mainstream media. I'm unlearning a lot and relearning a lot. And so none of this is medical advice. Coming from me, you have to consult with your own doctor and uh, do your own research. And I just want you all to know that the value here is that I cover censorship. I bring a lot of people on who are censored, who cover or deal in <clears throat> censored industries. And uh, I can get them in front of you and you can hear what they have to say. But again, I want you to do your own research and I want you to think for yourself. It's something that I think is <clears throat> not often encouraged by my old industry of, of mainstream news. So I want to try to do it here. So without further ado, we're going to bring in Dr. Jason Kinley. Dr. Kinley is a doctor of naturopathic medicine, right? Mountain View Vital Medicine. And you're also on the Board of Health, right, for Spokane County in Washington. That is correct. I do sit as a voting board member, which is a little unique. Uh, I don't know of any others in the state for sure. Uh, there may be in other jurisdictions outside of Washington State, but as far as I know, I'm the only naturopath that sits on a board uh, in our state. Okay. All right. So <clears throat> for the portion that's going to be up on YouTube, before we get into all the the details and other questions that I think people have been writing in, I posted on my local. So heads up, if you want to get some of this stuff ahead of time and just opine early on and put your questions in, go to allisonmorrow.locals.com. That's where I post a lot of a lot of my topics for the week. We also do uh, live editorial board meetings on Saturday morning. So it's a great way to get a hold of me and, and help uh, pick out topics for the week ahead. I wanted to ask you first off, since I, I cover censorship, that's that's what I do, and and I cover censored medicine now in the world of COVID. This is just me. I I notice even talking to the medical doctors who are who are willing to question the COVID narrative that when you start getting into naturopathic medicine, even some of them are like, ah, yeah, but that's too far. That's too far. And uh, so I wanted to bring you on first to just to talk about uh, about how we got a medical system now where even talking about natural immunity in today's world apparently is uh, really controversial. So could you back us up? Tell us, I guess, Dr. Kinley, a little bit about yourself, like how you got into it, but then give us a big picture of, of sort of the history of naturopathic medicine and, and where it is today in, uh, in comparison to like the established medical world. So, uh, sure. A little bit about me. I have a large family. I've got eight kids, uh, and I have a farm that, uh, we have that we're running on the side, uh, with various animals and really it's to support ourselves, our own family. Um, we grow our own food, uh, in large part, you know, as much as we can. As far as how I got into this, I had a traumatic brain injury, uh, almost 15 years ago. And uh, my wife um, suggested that I get into this field after using naturopathic medicine to help my own particular process. And once we started the journey, I thought, you know, that's a little crazy. We're a little older. We've already got a couple of kids, uh, but we ended up pursuing that path. And here I am. So that's how I got to where I am. And the reason I sought out uh, different types of care was because the conventional system had failed me earlier in life. Uh, antibiotic use repeatedly for things that we now know, even in the conventional world, even according to the American Academy of Pediatrics, you wouldn't give antibiotics for as a first line treatment. Uh, one of the things that's interesting is 50% of what we know in medicine 
and we're talking across all spectrums, but primarily conventional, is uh, found to be wrong every 10 years. So what we know now, if you take 100% of everything we know now in 10 years, half of that will be discovered to have problems, flawed, or issues with it. And the way that that works and the reason that we have that problem, you have to go all the way back to the founding of the AMA in the 1840s. I believe the AMA was founded in 1847. And a lot of this information comes from a colleague of mine who put together a very well documented uh, with prime source documents uh, presentation uh, on the history of medicine in America and how healthcare became sick care is what he called it. And his name is Dr. Rick Kirshner. And what we know is that when the American Medical Association was founded, it had two tenets that it was working towards, and that was improvement of the public opinion of medical doctors. If you look in newspaper articles, uh, different magazine publications, whatever, at that time, people did not want to see a doctor. They went to a naturopath, a homeopath, a chiropractor, an herbalist, anybody but somebody who was considered a medical doctor at that time and for good reason and that was that there were no standards if you were of how to treat and the way you became a doctor was you didn't go to school you went and apprenticed under somebody else and if that person was really good they could sign you off now they did have medical schools but it wasn't required to go so they had to improve their public opinion and they had to improve the financial standings of their physicians. And the reason for that was suicide among the doctors, that profession was incredibly high because they couldn't support themselves and they were very frustrated. Uh, interesting to note that if you read about the death of George Washington, a lot of times people say, oh, he died of pneumonia. And this is where the narrative already starts to break down. If you look at how they treated him, they did bloodletting which was standard practice at the time. And they gave him 38 grams of a particular product that contained mercury. So he was actually poisoned with mercury. Uh, and that's really ultimately what led to his death. Although the books will list it as pneumonia. So you start with the AMA founding to try to improve and compete with all the other professions that are out there. You fast forward to 1908, 1908, the AMA is going bankrupt. And the reason they're going bankrupt is they still can't get their act together at that particular point in time. They're trying to establish medical boards. They're trying to establish state legislation to have licensing requirements. And some of these things were not bad ideas or a bad direction to go. The problem was when they went bankrupt, John D. Rockefeller stepped in to bankroll the AMA. Now, the reason that's a huge problem is John D. Rockefeller owned Standard Petroleum, which was making petroleum-based pharmaceuticals. So you now have the marriage of medicine and money at the same time. As soon as you join that interest and you've got one guy funding both sides of that equation, you are now going to have a problem because it's no longer about making you well. It's about getting you back to work for the bottom line. So go forward a few more years, 1917, there's a thing called the Flexner Report. The Flexner Report graded all the medical schools across the country with an A, B, or C rating. And what those ratings were for, if you had an A rating as a medical school, you were in great shape. You could go ahead and continue to operate as you were already doing. If you had a B rating, yeah, you got some things you need to change. If you had a C rating, you basically had to overhaul your program or shut your doors. And the things that they removed at that time Herbalism, nutrition, homeopathy, anything with spinal alignment, chiropractic type work, all of those things were being removed from medical schools. It wasn't that they were being questioned. It was said, you can't use them. You have to remove them. So we lost a large number of ideas in medicine because they were told they weren't valid. What's interesting is there's this whole concept now about what is scientific and we're saying follow the science and oh, you don't follow the science. People don't realize that the medical system and community called themselves scientific. It wasn't the outside world. It wasn't independent folks outside of medicine who said, wow, they've got a scientific rigor about themselves. The AMA and the medical establishment actually classified themselves as we are scientific and we are doing the science which sounds very similar to what we're hearing right now. 
in a lot of these different discussions. But that is, again, this is all prime source stuff. You can go look all of this up. So when you had the Flexner report and we shut down the schools, we lost a lot of the ability to challenge things over 100 years ago. The conversations that we are now having because of COVID and people asking just questions, just asking, were the same types of things they were running into 100 years ago. Uh, it doesn't matter whether it's vaccination, medications, uh, surgery, procedures, whatever. All Anything that was being questioned, like, wow, I, I, have a, I don't know if this is right. Let's ask this question. If you push the envelope too hard, they said, nope, you're gone. See you later. Uh, and that was, you know, the story of the day. When Flexner uh, in the 1970s, we exported our system of medicine that we had then developed in the United States and pushed it through the World Health Organization. And Flexner said that that was one of the biggest mistakes that he had ever made in his life was that he published this report because he realized what he was seeing was things that we were not doing well, and now we were exporting it to other systems. Uh, I've studied over in Germany twice, and one thing that's interesting to note is that they're using our system of medicine, but they held on to their roots. So their dermatologist, I sat in with a dermatologist. I don't do dermatology as a specialty, but I just that was one of the rounds I was doing. And they were using things like pine tar for eczema. They would use UV light, things that we don't do here on a regular basis that they hold on to over there for sure they will prescribe hydrotherapy type treatments which we'll talk more about later if needed uh to their patients and the their healthcare system will pay for it hmm. because they recognize the value and utility and that originated there not here so some of the european nations other hmm. nations that hold on to those things still have some of those because they're not the originators. They just received our gift of medicine as we know it through an exportation. So that's that's really how we ended up here. So now add COVID to that. How has that changed pressure to conform or I guess anything else? I mean, when you're when you're looking at all of those different factors, money, influence, power leading up to this, and now you have this uh this new virus that everybody's uh, freaking out about at the beginning uh, because we're going to overwhelm hospitals. And now, uh, you know, the messaging keeps changing, but uh, there's, there's a lot of, uh, you know, real fear at the, at the very beginning, especially about it. And and, I mean, I could understand at the beginning, uh, we don't know what this is and what's going on, but at the same time, that would have been a great opportunity, at least in my opinion, to be able to hear alternative voices. And that's exactly the opposite of what happened. We 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 were like, no, even though it's brand new and a lot of people are scared about it, uh, we're we're not gonna let other people you know talk outside of like ventilators or whatever else was the talking point. I've had Dr. David Brownstein, MD, <clears throat> family medicine. And he wasn't even allowed to post interviews with his patients on his own website. The um, the government, the federal government came after him for that. So it seemed like at the very time when we were we were needing to hear different voices about immunity, you know, just like, hey, we don't know how to treat this virus. So maybe let's just make sure our immune systems are robust enough to deal with it. Uh, that was exactly the time that that kind of information was being suppressed. So, so let's talk a little bit about that. What have you seen, not just at the beginning, but over the course of the last year and a half related to that? So what I would say is that it's made the, any divisions that existed in theory much more apparent, right? There's a saying, you don't ride the fence because you get splinters where you don't want them. So this particular situation with COVID has really, uh, it's pushed people into different camps as it were in some folks went to one side that I was completely surprised by, whether it was colleagues or conventional MD, DO, whatever. There are people that have stepped out on, you know, on a side where they think uh, the narrative is needs to be challenged. And I was surprised by who did that. And then I saw other people go, no, the narrative's correct. And I was surprised by who was over there. But there really isn't much left of anybody sitting in the middle anymore going, oh, well, uh, do I go? Wh wh I, I don't know. People have made up their minds right or wrong. People have done their own uh, research, a lot of them, not everybody, and dug in and said, well, no, you know, whichever side they're falling on, that's where they're at. Uh, at the beginning, you're right. We didn't know what we were dealing with. And so everybody was a little like, wow, this is really crazy. The stories were coming out so hard, so fast. Uh, we were really trying to navigate this. And the conversation around immunity 
the reason we couldn't have it was because anything that we would have had, we threw out a hundred years ago because now, uh, in fact, there was a, I think there was a lawsuit a few years ago. Uh, one of the medical textbooks, what they found in the medical textbook, it was funded and paid for by the industries that had a vested interest in the utilization of their products. So you're going through your path book, you're going through your treatment, whatever. And in there is a specific medical device on this is how you use and treat. We'll say, you know, you need to put a pacemaker in a company that develops a pacemaker is giving money for the development of that book because now it's product placement. It's like an ad placement on TV. And that's occurring in our uh, pharmaceutical, you know, uh, learning education in the conventional side. Uh, somebody the other day just posted a video I saw of how many different mainstream news channels and was all sponsored by Pfizer. I'm sure you probably saw that. But Pfizer was like brought to you by Pfizer, CNN brought to you by Pfizer, ABC News brought to you. That's happening in the medical schools. If that happens in the medical school, the only thing you can know is this, right? RDA guidelines, RDA, um, RDI, recommended daily allowance, recommended daily intake. Those guidelines were not designed necessarily to keep you healthy. That's what they'll say. They were designed to prevent a problem. Scurvy, for example, we know if you don't have enough vitamin C, you get scurvy. So those guidelines have changed and manipulated over time. But it's like the whole Got Milk campaign. You remember that about 30 years ago? They had all these big famous people, right? Mm -hmm. It was uh, basically subsidizing the dairy industry, right? Dairy is not a great source of calcium. Dark leafy green vegetables and commercially produced eggshells that are pulverized and put back into food. That's where a lot of our calcium actually comes from in food that you buy in the stores. So we can't know anything about nutrition if everything that we would have been able to have the conversation was silenced 100 years ago. You've gotten you've gotten some spotlight, right? Some yeah, kind of spotlight. A little bit. yeah. This is the uh, spokesman uh, review. Spokane Health Board member who spread misinformation at May Day Stay Home Rally draws criticism from colleagues. Yeah, and they do seem to be focused a lot on the mask uh, issue here that you were talking without a mask, and but that you did not respond to multiple requests for comment for the article. Uh, grab the microphone with a smile and launch into a minutes long polemic deriding stay home orders and widely accepted public health guidelines offered at the state, local and national level. So, so I want, I want to have you respond to that and, and just big picture talk about how the media has affected this in your opinion, since that's my background. But first, uh, you know, maybe you're looking for an alternative way to wake up in the morning and you should definitely check out twininginecoffee.com slash Allison, twininginecoffee.com slash Allison. Uh, it's a way to support my work and drink great high altitude shade grown Nicaraguan roast. There's a wide variety of coffees and a Kurtura tea. You can make tea. I cold brew 24 hours. It's great with a stick of cinnamon in a mason jar. It's awesome. Uh, so check that out if you want to support my work and your coffee drinker. But if you need something a little bit heavier at the end of the day, because you're totally depressed about what you're seeing on my channel, you should check out AllisonWinePromo.com. AllisonWinePromo.com. You get 50% off of my favorite Argentinian Malbecs. These are also high altitude Malbecs. Uh, one of the new three bottles in my pairing is from one of the highest vineyards in the entire world at the 8,950 feet. And uh, there are a couple others. So you get 50% off the bottles and 50% off of the shipping too. So go to allisonwinepromo.com or twininginecoffee.com slash Allison. Is there anything else you'd like to say before we go uh, that you just really want people to hear? You are responsible for your own health care. Nobody else is. And the medical decisions belong to the patient. They do not belong to the doctor, and that includes me. Okay, so if you end up getting sick and you end up going to a hospital, your job is to ask the questions. If you can't ask the question, you need to get a patient advocate in the hospital. Every hospital has them. Okay, um, we've had several patients where they ended up in the hospital. I pushed the family to get a patient advocate, and the patient advocate was able to help them navigate the treatments they wanted and didn't want. The medical system is not there because of you. They are there to help you, and the decisions belong to you every step of the way. A doctor's job is not to heal you. A doctor's job is to give you the information so that you can make the decision that best fits your wants, needs, desires with what you've been presented. Okay. People come back all the time and go, oh, the doctor cured me. And people will say that about me. Hey, I love that. That's great. But I really didn't. I gave you the information and helped guide the process. Surgeons 
take something out or put something in and then the body still has to finish the job. They didn't cure you. They aided the process in healing. Your body still has to do the work. It doesn't mean that drugs are bad and that surgery is wrong. It just means that we really need to evaluate each and every medical decision that you are making and make sure, do you really need that? Uh, the prime and easiest example before we go is antibiotics for ear infections. That used to be the standard of care. The American Academy of Pediatrics no longer recommends that as a standard for most ear infections because most of them are viral.